Hello everyone, it's Taxibity here, and for today, so Smash Ultimate, I've talked about this a lot of times throughout my throughout the Smash Brothers hype train throughout the past couple of years and all, and you know it is fun to look back at some things, especially with the DLC roster. With the DLC roster, we've gotten a total of 13 characters, including Piranha Plant, with all of them having their own unique move set and playstyle, and given out brand new representation for franchises that were never seen before or. After Added into the Smash Brothers universe. However, some nowadays have been, has been kind of thinking that there should have been characters that deserve that spot over that character. Like, I don't know, like Crash Bandicoot should have gotten in before Sora or Steve or whatever. So, in this video, I just want to be going through a bit of a nostalgia dive and talking about some of the reasons on why all 13 characters were chosen into, uh, into the DLC lineup and why they were chosen over the other characters to be exact. Before I start, I want to mention a couple things. Number one, that these are that some of my reasons are my own personal reasons as there were some characters that doesn't really have an exact um, reason or explanation of why they were even added to begin with and another thing is that I will not be mentioning Piranha Plant in this one I know I said 13 and all but just to make this quick I I feel like Piranha Plant was just added just for the sake of you know trolling and trolling the Smash Brothers community and especially for the fact that it's considered to be a joke character we've had a couple of joke characters in Smash games before, so I don't really think I should be surprised about this one. And another thing is that I will be pulling some sources from another path from some past articles that were stated before whether it's common knowledge at this point or if that's some that didn't really aren't aware about this and you know i know i've seen some that are spreading information misinformation about this so i hope you all enjoy this and let's get started talking about on why the smash Bros. dlc roster was chosen started off with the main character per to persona 5 joker Alrighty, Joker. We didn't expect this character of all of all things to get into Smash Brothers. When Nintendo was announced was announcing to, to, be, to be the ones to choose the fighters, many were assuming it was going to be some bored Nintendo character to start of the Fighters Pass. But no, Joker took off by a landslide as this character was now as, was introduced as our first DLC fighter of the Fighters Pass. Nobody saw it coming, and neither did I. But why exactly did this character get chosen out of all the characters? as our first fighter. Well, to put things simple, number one is that, first of all, from what we can see from the Smash Bros. menu, it seemed to be taking some styles and elements from the Persona 5's menus and all, and, you know, I don't blame them. Persona 5's menus is one of the flashiest and most stylish-looking menus I've seen in RPGs and video games, so that's pretty much one of them. Another thing to mention is that I feel like Nintendo and Atlas were trying to strengthen their relationship as a company, as in the past, we do see Atlas and Nintendo supporting each other in terms of games. The Shimagama Tensei games, to be exact, were added as sort of a, you know you know, relationship and, you know, relationship between Nintendo and Atlas and all, but Persona specifically were only exclusively on PlayStation, and the only Persona-related things we had at the time before Joker was was announced for Smash Brothers was the Persona Q and Q2 games for the Nintendo 3DS, and that was just the only Persona-related things we've had on the Nintendo Switch, and, or, and you know, other Nintendo handhelds as well, and we wouldn't get them until Persona 5 Strikers on 2020, and eventually Persona 3 through 5 Royal on the Nintendo Switch from this year and then last October. So to me, to me given that, you know, with Nintendo and Atlas, I feel like they just wanted to strengthen their relationship as a company, especially given that since Atlas is supposed to be owned by Sega, from what I can remember, and with Sega being fully fine with Sonic and Bayonetta being in Smash Brothers, Atlas never had any representation at all, at all yet, aside from the Shin Megami Tensei and Fire Emblem crossover they had back in 2015 in the Wii U, and then its remake or remaster version on the Switch, and then its spirits were shown in the Fire Emblem list as well. So yeah, that's just one of the reasons and why Joker was chosen to begin with. Next up is the hero from the Dragon Quest franchise. This right here is an easy explanation. Now, when this character was announced back in E3 2019, the West really wasn't too hype about it. I mean, yeah, it was really cool to see it, but they really, but there really wasn't that much hype or excitement during that time. But really, but in Japan, however, that was a different story because Dragon Quest in Japan is one of the biggest franchises out there. And while the West isn't, and while you know Dragon Quest isn't as popular in the West, unlike its 
you know, unlike its cousin Final Fantasy and all, Dragon Quest in Japan is treated as sort of a different and huge franchise. Every, whenever there's a new Dragon Quest game, there's always going, it's like treating the game like it's Christmas. I kind of wish we had a game that we treated like it's Christmas after all, but anyways, Dragon Quest is a huge thing in Japan, and it's shown in many cases from merchandise to, you know, installments, and with Dragon Quest 3 as the biggest example, Dragon Quest 3 is the biggest installment of the franchise, and it was so huge that, I, from what I can remember, there were, like, high school and school kids that straight up skipped school just for the games to, to, to release. That just shows how huge Dragon Quest really is as a whole. Another thing to mention is that given with the relationship of Square Enix and Nintendo in the 2010s, it seems that they pretty much wanted to hypen up and strengthen their bond even more thanks to the inclusion of Cloud back in 2015. Another thing to mention is that there was also a new Dragon Quest game coming out at the time for the Nintendo Switch, being Dragon Quest 11 S Echoes of Elusive Age Definitive Edition. So not only did Sakurai add a Dragon Quest 11 uh, character to serve as a promotion, but he also added three other characters to serve as sort of a celebration of Dragon Quest as a whole. Dragon Quest 3, obviously being added because it's the biggest one of um, the entire franchise. Number of uh, Dragon Quest IV's protagonist is pretty much because they played the sort of the same way. And then for Dragon Quest VIII, it was actually the biggest um, Dragon Quest installment in the West at the time. So you can kind of tell how much, how huge Dragon Quest is in the East. And while it isn't as big in, while it, the franchise isn't as big as Japan I'm in the West, I'm pretty sure Japan had a lot of hype when, when seeing this character. However, in the West, we did have a similar sort of character that did almost the exact same thing. Banjo and Kazooie from, well, Banjo and Kazooie. So, Banjo Kazooie is a character that many fans have wanted for a long time. And with it being its first Microsoft rep, it was something else to say at least. And because at the time, Rand Banjo Kazooie was initially a Nintendo character. They were Nintendo's owners. They were, they basically were owned by Nintendo, but after the buyout of Microsoft buying out Rare, we haven't really seen Banjo or Kazooie or any of the Rare games in a long, long time. And with Nintendo and Microsoft and especially Sony being a huge rival company, many thought it was going to be impossible. But there were some instances where we do get to see some support of a Banjo coming in Smash Brothers. Phil Spencer, who I think is the CEO of Xbox currently, stated that he really wanted to see Banjo in Smash Brothers at some point, which it happened in reality. Not only that, Sakurai tends to visit these companies personally and in, in first part and you know in person which is really why it got it was really easy to get banjo and kazooie into this game to begin with another thing to mention is that given with you know how very mellow nintendo and microsoft were nowadays it seems that they wanted banjo and kazooie to be to work out to begin with Next up is Terry Bogard from the Fatal Fury and King of Fighters series. While Terry isn't as popularly requested, unlike other characters in on, on an online standpoint, Terry Bogard had at least some reasons to be added into this game. First of all, Smash Brothers is a fighting game, so we gotta have at least some more fighting game representation in this one. Another thing to mention is that Sakurai is a personal is a personal huge fan of the Fra King of Fighters and Fatal Fury series, with him stating that he played some of the King of Fighters games in the arcade days, especially Iori Yagami being his absolute favorite. Another thing to mention is that given with, you know, Ryu and Ken being added as sort of a way to represent Capcom, Terry in a way wants to represent not only SNK as a whole, but a character that technically comes from a fr franchise of crossover fighting games. We've seen Terry crossover with other fighting games that isn't just Fatal Fury. We've seen that with King of Fighters and also the girl version of that Fatal Fury game. He also crossed over with SNK versus Capcom as well. You can tell that Terry, despite, you know, you can tell that Terry, despite not being popularly requested, is at least a, is at least a nice little addition to represent more of SNK and, and you know, and the and Capcom as a whole. Another thing to mention is that, like I mentioned with the Joker, with the relationship of Atlas and Nintendo, I'm pretty sure this is one of the reasons on why they added because they wanted to strengthen the relationship as a company between Nintendo and SNK as a whole.
Next up, the last character for the first Fighters Pass, Violet, the main protagonist to Fire Emblem Free Houses. This right here is our very first Fire Emblem character and first first party character in this, in Smash Brothers DLC lineup. And by far, it's the most controversial one because you know we've all seen how many fans reacted to Violet, at, you know, as a character, and especially him them being a Fire Emblem character as a as you know. Whatever. My point is, is that at the time, Violet really had a lot of hard times, especially from the fan base, because that because we've already gotten Krom as an Echo Fighter in the Smash Ultimate's base roster, and we had Corrin as one of the final two DLC characters back in the Smash Four days. So it being another Fire Emblem character, and, and while it being DLC and the last character of the first Fighters Pass, felt a bit off. However, there are still good reasons on why they still on why they added it to begin with. Number one is that Fire Emblem Three Houses had a very huge launch day back in July of 2019. It sold over three million copies after some time, and it really shows. Not only that, Fire Emblem is still was making a name for itself as Fire Emblem Awakening and definitely helped boost the franchise even further, and especially with the sales of Fire Emblem Fates thanks to Corrin's inclusion and with Violet as a and with Violet being added and all the its reputation as a Fire Emblem character, the thing about adding this character is that they wanted to boost more promotions with Fire Emblem Free Houses and with the and with the big launch day that Free Houses had, it was no big deal why Nintendo and Sakurai wanted to choose this to begin with. And it was pretty much the latest Fire Emblem protagonist at the time, so it was just a no bigger big biggie. And now with the first Fighters Pass out of the way, we now get to the second Fighters Pass with our second first party character, Min Min from ARMS. ARMS was a new franchise added to the Nintendo series library. After the success of Splatoon, ARMS was now added as a Switch exclusive. And while ARMS didn't sell as well as Splatoon, it was still quite a fun game with lovable characters, great designs, interesting lore, and pretty great gameplay overall. Now. At the time before Ultimate was released, many fans were wanting to have uh, uh, arms represent uh, an arms representative into this game, being specifically Springman. The real problem was, however, was the fact that arms was just too new at the time. And not by saying that it was too new that it shouldn't get a fighter yet. No, I meant that it was way too late for it to be a new game. Because uh, from what I can recall, the Smash Ultimate base roster was already chosen at the time, and that was really just something. And that was really unfortunate because arms was announced at around 2017 and then Smash Ultimate's and then Smash Ultimate's base roster was already chosen about around 2016 right after Smash 4's DLC lineup was completed. So Springman was chosen as an assist trophy and then Min Min and then Min Min was um, was you know Min Min Twin Tails Ribbon Girl and then Ninjara were added as spirits when Ribbon Girl being a playable me costume and all so yeah they didn't really have that but with Arms now being added as a DLC fighter they had to choose another type of character being Min Min now why Min Min out of all the characters well f first it's the fact that Min Min is one of the most popular and most fan favorite characters in the Arms game right behind Twin Tail and all another thing to mention is that she's by far that she was the winner of that one party crash which was its last one when Min Min being its winner and then last but not least that being the producer of RM State and then Min Min was his personal favorite so I can honestly see that with Ninja Ninjar was close to it being however but they honestly but we couldn't really chosen a better choice than Min Min given how she was a really popular arms character plus I feel like with it being added I think they just wanted to give it the sort of treatment that it should have had from the very beginning in just like we did with Splatoon. It was unfortunate that it was pretty new at the time that it couldn't make it, but hey, we still at least had some representation before Min Min was added as a playable character. Next up is Steve and Alex from Minecraft. Who knew Minecraft would get added into this? So why exactly was the character was this character added to begin with? Well, it all started back, believe it or not, in 2015. Well, from what I can recall, a former worker who worked for Minecraft has stated that there were negotiations between Mojang and Nintendo to have a Minecraft representative in Smash 4. However, it seemed that at the time it didn't really go well, and we gotta remember, when, Pro when Program and Steve and Alex into this game, 
they basically have a mining mechanic which we have to remember there's over a hundred stages in this game making it really impossible for a game like smash 4 to program steve and alex to do that whole mining mechanic with only 50 to 60 stages at the time well it really wasn't as bad as it thought for all we know the wii u may not actually handle it very well and like I said, they've been working and negotiating this since 2015, and with Minecraft being a very popular franchise, like by far one of the biggest selling franchises video games out there, you can really see why Nintendo and, and Mojang wanted to add this to begin with. Even though it took some time, it was well worth it for all the programming, to be honest. Next up is Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII. Who knew one of the, ah uh, yes, the big bad of that game. Well, being one of the most popular villains of the franchise and of the franchise, and by far the most iconic villain in video games, right next to Bowser and Ganondorf, it was no problem on why they added this to begin with. However, why exactly was Sephiroth added? Out of you know, you know, out of all the different RPG characters. To put it simple, it was how Final Fantasy was represented. With Smash 4, I can kind of get Cloud and Square Enix. They kind of had a bit of a hard, a bit of a hard time with the license and all. So Cloud only had like one stage, two trophies, and even like two music tracks and all. And it really wasn't that bad. But with Sephiroth added, and but now with Ultimate, it seemed that they had the same thing. Cloud and Cloud Spirit didn't have its official artwork. We didn't really have any new stages or anything else. No new music tracks. It was still the same two two music tracks we've had from smash 4 it would kind of shows how very shallow final fantasy was at the time so from what i can interpret since there's not exactly any information on why they wanted to add it as several to begin to you know really begin with well one obviously it has to do with the license the license is really hard as sakura stated because you know sometimes square can be a little bit salty and how how the you know license can be especially with its music but i guess after some negotiations they managed to do it so to me the reason they added sephra was to sort of give a give out a sort of a forgiveness for having for how sh cl shallow cloud and final fantasy 7 how was re was represented and after sephra was added like cloud spirits cloud spirits count has now increased cloud's official artwork has now been added to his fighter spirit and with sephron now being added it seems that they wanted to strengthen the bond even more with square enix and nintendo l nintendo really Next up is Pyra and Mithra from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. So this is sort of a similar reason of why they were added just like with Min Min. They were, it's because Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was already a too, a too late and very new game at the time. With Smash Ultimate's deal from base roster lineup already chosen, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 didn't get as much representation with fighters or anything else, and instead Pyramidra and along with a few other characters were resorted as spirits, costumes, and, you know, music tracks. And that's really about it for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But with the Fighters Pass 2 coming out, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 got its chance with Pyra and Mithra. But why were these characters chosen specifically and not the main character Rex as we saw from Shulk? Well, first off, many thought Rex and Pyra would work, but it was due to one thing technical issues and hardware issues okay that's two things but according to sakurai it was stated that rex was initially going to get added as a character along with a swappable pyra and mithra kind of like what they did was kind of like how xenoblade chronicles 2 work when it comes to playing as rex however due to the hardware limitations and how it can handle the game as how it can handle switching characters while having the main character playing around it was really hard for it to be it so that's kind of why rex was resorted as sort of an assistance along with Pyra and Mithra and that's why these characters were still able to add be added despite not having Rex as its main character source and not only that they even wanted to brought they even brought back the cut Zelda and Sheik swap swapping mechanic after they were separated back in Smash 4 so it's nice it was a nice little reminder of how of what the mechanic was from the Smash Melee days and it was great to see Xenoblade 2 now getting more represent represented it and it was just the same reason of why arms couldn't get added to begin with. 
Next up, Kazuya Mishima from the Tekken series. Tekken as a whole is honestly a late franchise that should have been added back in the Smash 4 days, but why exactly was it what were they added they added Tekken right about now? Well, first of all, is from the fact that Bandai Namco were the ones that that were developing Smash 4 and now with Smash Ultimate at the time. And given with Pac-Man being added back in back in Smash 4, it was no biggie that Tekken out of all the character out of all the gaming franchises Bandai Namco had would have been added first. I mean, yeah, Tales of would have been would have been added first. But if we're gonna add more fighting game representatives, then we would have had it. But why exactly was Kazuya out of the big two, out of these characters when we could have had Jin Kazuma or Heihachi Mishima? Well, it's obvious. Number one is the fact that Kazuya was before the main protagonist for the first three Tekken games, right before he became evil throughout after Tekken three. Another thing to mention is that as Sakurai mentioned in the in the Kazuya presentation, he Hayashi was difficult to, you know, make a move set because he didn't have the devil gene to which Kazuya Mishima had to begin to ha had to, to which Kazuya Mishima have, and while Jin Kazuma would have been added because he had the devil gene, Kazuya seems more of a better fit as he was like the main character from the first ever Tekken game before he became a villain. So, and not only that, Tekken was really overdue at this point, and given with how very great friends Ka um, Harada and Ka Sakurai has together, it was no biggie that they. Had they added a Tekken character. And last but not least, Sora from Kingdom Hearts. Now, I think we all know one of the big reasons on why many would not think that Sora shouldn't get added, and that's because of Disney. There's a lot of information about having Sora get in the Smash Brothers um, from the start. So first of all, is that Sakurai mentioned that Sora was the most requested fighter in the Fighters Ballot. And I did forget to mention that Banjo was actually the second most requested character in the Fighters Ballot, just right behind Sora himself. But the thing about it though is that Sakurai stated that so adding Sora was kind of impossible at the time but it would have not been impossible if it weren't for a certain event that happened right around out of 2019. The second Fighters Pass was meant to have five fighters but after a after Sakurai met with a Japan executive of Disney they had a negotiation about having Sora in Smash Brothers. And you know it's even more funnier it's the fact that Disney despite many claiming that Disney would say no, actually just straight up agreed to it. They just said, okay, sure, we'll just add Sora. The real problem, however, was Tetsuya Nomura, you know, the creator of Kingdom Hearts and the one who draws all the character artwork from the Final Fantasy and the Kingdom Hearts characters. He stated he didn't want Sora to get added because it might interfere with the Kingdom Hearts lore and all. And yeah, while it didn't question some Kingdom Hearts fans, including myself, if that was canon or not, my point is, it's that Sora's including was a success. Yeah, sure, they may have to cut things down, such as not having Donald and Goofy in this one, and only keeping the Mickey symbol. It really still shows that Disney was still okay with having Sora into Smash Brothers, and especially with him being helped as the most number one most requested character of the Fighters Ballad, right next to Banjo and Kazooie. So these are all of the reasons of why the DLC characters were added into Smash Ultimate's lineup. While many would have preferred other characters, you can tell that Sakurai went through all the feats and effort into adding these iconic characters into the game. Into the into the game. I want to know all your thoughts and opinions down below about this. Who do you think was the best character added into Smash Bros. Ultimate? And what do you think? And what when what mind-boggling fact did you learn about? You know how these characters were added to you know do to, to start with i want to know all your thoughts and opinions down below about this and so with that leave a like comment subscribe hit the notification bell for more videos follow me on twitter and i'll see you guys next time and remember this once a legend always a legend